Good evening. Good evening. We are so glad everyone is here. It's wonderful to be inside out of either the rain or the heat. You can take your choice, which uh, might happen, but one of the things is it sure has been warm the last couple of days. And that's been a, a kind of a typical thing for our crusade. But that's all right. We're in where it's cool, it's dry. And we're just so glad you're here this evening. Uh, we are going to uh, start off with some worship. And uh, we're going to sing some uh, songs that uh, you probably are very familiar with. Leaning on the everlasting arms, turn your eyes upon Jesus and glory to his name. We want you to join in and sing with us. Just praise the Lord tonight because that's what we're here to do.
Oh, wow. Hey, I want everybody to thank Sam Porter for filling in on drums tonight. And you know, this was not at all possible unless we would have tied down this young lady here to be our accomplice for the whole crusade. Thank you to Peggy Harmon. At this time tonight, we have a very special guest with us and his wife. We have Sean Agnew from St. Joe and his wife, Jessica. And uh, Sean's been a good friend for many years. He's about the age of my son, Kathleen, my son, Bryce. And we've just been in music circles with Sean for a long, long period of years. Sean directs all music at the Ashland Methodist Church in St. Joe on Ashland Avenue. And he also is a professor of voice at Missouri Western State University. So would you please put your hands together and welcome Sean tonight, who's gonna to give his testimony. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanna thank uh, Jimmy. I have known Jimmy for almost 15 years now. And I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, uh, you're a very lucky community because there has not been one man in my life that's been more uh, influential, so I thank you. Uh, uh, just a little bit more about me. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, I'm from St. Joe. I've been there my whole life. Never thought I'd say that. Uh, I've uh, been the director of music at Ashland Methodist Church up there for about 10 years. Uh, I didn't think I'd say that either. Um, it's, it's, a, it's amazing how God just moves you and keeps you in certain places longer than maybe you think you're going to be there, but it's been a blessing for me. Um, I met my, my wife around three or so years ago, and um, we have been married for about two and a half years. And uh, a little bit more about me, I come from a single parent home, only child. I came out pretty well balanced, I think. Um, and uh, when I got married, that was my mother's greatest joy, to see me get married and to, uh, to see me off in that way. And uh, two weeks after we got married, uh, my life kind of came crashing down upon me in a way in that we found out that my mom had uh, stage four lung cancer. And it was really only a matter of time. And during this point in my life, obviously we, we just got married, um, we were getting ready for Easter at my church. I was teaching at the university. I'd already been committed to uh, work one of their big music pro musical productions of the year. And so we're bouncing around all of those places, going to the hospital. Life was just simply overwhelming. And then this moment where life is supposed to be your happiest, you know, just getting married, uh, having this sense of reality come crashing down was a, was a very difficult thing for me. And there were many moments in the quiet parts of my life where I said, why is this happening? You know, why, why now? Um, but as we went through that ordeal, um, God became ever so more evident in my life. And uh, six months later, as, uh, as we were in the hospital room and she passed, uh, we had time to reflect on all that God had done in our lives in the midst of that horrible tragedy. And it reminded me of a uh, passage in Isaiah as he's talking to the, uh, the Hebrew nation that is uh, in exile. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. And God loves us and God provides for us in the darkest trials of our life. And he surrounds us with his arms. And during that moment, uh, during that time of my life, that just became so, so much more aware. And even as this past week has kind of been a difficult uh, week for us, just with circumstances kind of going on and the things that we're involved in, that God is so much a part of it. And sometimes it's during those dark, difficult times that we see God even more working in our lives. And that has been such a testimony for my life and such been, a, been such a blessing in my life to come to realize that even more and more these past couple of years. I'm going to sing a song for you that is uh, very special and important to me. Um, this is a song that I have sung a number of times, and although my mother had heard me sing hundreds of songs probably in my lifetime, um, I think this may have been, maybe not her favorite, but the most important one for her. Um, and it also was the song that I sang at her funeral. And I never really thought I'd be able to sing it again, 
Um, but God really was moving in my heart this summer when, when Jimmy asked me to come and speak and to sing. And I said, I, I think I need to sing the song again, not not for her or not for me, because I think this is the message that God really wants wants us to know and wanted me to tell you that God in the darkest and hardest times of our life, he is still there wrapping his arms around you. So this is called Safe Within Your Arms.
We want to continue our time of worship and our time of praise. We have two more songs that we would like to uh, you all to join us with tonight, and that is Blessed Be the Name of the Lord and Because He Lives.
We would like to, uh, at this time, call our trumpet player from the band up to preach to us. Dr. Anderson, great job on the trumpet. It's so great to hear that sound. It's a, it's a beautiful instrument. You did it very, very well. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to go get my Bible and get ready to hear some good preaching. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm one of those used to be's on the uh, trumpet, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it's all in how you hold your mouth, you know. <laughs> Actually, I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to the first song, Psalm number one. I had uh, originally planned to preach on the book of Amos, chapter four, verse twelve. Prepare to meet thy God. Well, this is a, a different passage, but of course it's the Word of God. And uh, if you have it and you're able to stand, if you're not able to stand, don't worry about it. But if you are, let's stand while we have a reading of the Word, the very first psalm. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. I'll read the rest of it because it's quite a contrast to the first part, first three verses, and we'll only be dealing with the first three verses. But it continues, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. Shall we go to our Lord in prayer? Thank you, dear Father, for the messages of song by the choir and by this wonderful soloist tonight for the testimony of faith. Thank you for the musicians and their part. And thank you for those who were praying even before the service began. Thank you for uh, Pastor Jimmy being able to be with us tonight. We do pray for his continued health. Bless all of the pastors those who are here tonight and those who could not be with us, watch over them and the churches, the churches that are represented here tonight, those that uh, have other obligations and responsibilities and could not be here. And all we pray that you would bless their lives as well. For those who know you as personal Savior have received this grace that we don't deserve, but we certainly need it because we're all sinners. And they received by faith the work that Jesus performed when He came to earth and when He was willing to bear our sins and pay our debt and rise triumphantly in our place. We thank You for those who trusted Him and that You might give strength, that You might give courage, that You might give guidance, all that we might be as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation where we are to shine forth the good news of the gospel. May through our lives, our homes, our families, our churches, and in the community where we go, the light shine. May it shine to bring people to this light and to this faith. And we pray for those who have sickness and sorrows and difficulties that they might have comfort and where it would please you, there might be healing. And otherwise, there, there might be strength and comfort and guidance in the midst of difficult times. We pray for those who have never known what it means to be born again, who've never been set free from their sins. They have no lasting peace, we know, because the Scripture declares that there is no peace, saith my God, unto the wicked. It's like the troubled sea that casts the fire and dirt. There will be no peace until they find that peace in Jesus. And all we pray that through the changing hearts crusade that many hearts might be changed that many lives might be delivered, that many souls would be saved. 
Bless now through the preaching of your word. Hide the servant. Exalt the Savior. And may your word be clear. And we'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you may be seated. The very first song starts out with an unusual phrase, Blessed is the man. Because since Adam fell into sin and man was cast out of the Garden of Eden, there has been no peace, no joy to a person until they receive the blessing of God and the new life that God provides. Now in the Old Testament, it was promised to come. And they were saved the same way you are, by faith. That's what the Bible says. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And talking about two of the great to, uh, leaders of the Old Testament, the progenitor of the Hebrew nation, and the great king who represents and through his descending line comes the great eternal king of righteousness, David. So from Abraham and David, we have those examples given, for instance, in the book of Romans chapter 4. We're told that Abraham did not deserve to be saved because of his works or merits or his life or his position or some special uh, choice of God for this nation, but rather that he by faith received that which God promised, that David was saved by faith. And we're told in this book of Romans that that's how we are saved, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake to all who believe. And we're told that uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're told that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So this really is not so unusual of a statement to be made in the Old Testament times. Blessed is the man. But it does show you that uh, the psalmist, as the Spirit of God inspired his pen to write these words, anticipated the fact that we would be delivered from a cursed position and brought into a blessed position. And then he characterizes the person who by faith receives this saving grace, who by faith entrusts himself unto the Lord and his saving plan, and that he is therefore blessed, transferred from the curse unto the blessing. And there are three things it says about this blessed man. In verse 1, it tells us that he's free from the corruption of the world. In verse 2, it tells us that he's faithful to the counsels of God's word. And in verse 3, it says he is fruitful in the conduct of God's will. Three things. Free from the corruption of the world, faithful to the counsels of the word, and fruitful in the conduct of God's will. He's a blessed man. Who, and it says three characteristics about him and being delivered from the wickedness of sin and its influence upon his life. He doesn't walk, he doesn't stand, and he doesn't sit in those areas of evil. He doesn't walk. That's a word that simply means to go along with. He doesn't stand, that's a stronger word, meaning to take your position with. And he doesn't sit, and that's even stronger yet saying he is committed to something. He sits, he rests, he yields to that. So what is it that he doesn't walk with, he doesn't stand for, and he doesn't sit unto? Three things about that. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the philosophy and the viewpoints of men in this age apart from the revelation and the illumination of God's Word and God's Holy Spirit. The unsaved man doesn't have a right relationship with the Spirit of God. The unsaved man has rejected the light that he brings. The unsaved man does not know the sacred scriptures that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. He's walking in darkness and he goes along with a philosophy of the ungodly. But the person who's been set free from sin is free from this corrupt influence upon his life. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Rather, he walks in the counsel of the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against God, the Scripture says. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it tells us that the Word of God makes us wise unto salvation. So that we don't have to follow the foolish philosophies and the aphorisms and the ideologies and the uh, uh, counsels of men. But we follow that which is uh, true without error, the Word of God. And uh, so we're set free from those other counsels because we are in the counsel of the Word of God. It sets us free from sin and the matter of salvation. 
It also sets us free from the influence of sin in the matter of uh, service for the Lord as a Christian. And so he says uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is therefore profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the person of God, the man, the woman, the boy, and the girl that knows the Lord, that the person of God will be completely furnished unto every good work. And so he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly because he walks in the counsel of the Lord. Secondly, he doesn't stand or take his position with those who are actively involved in sin. If a person does walk in the counsel of the ungodly, he then finds himself on the slippery slide of then to the next level down, and that is a level of standing with those who do the evil. Uh, you know, a person who instigates a riot, for instance, is doing wrong. But those who go along with the person who instigates a riot is just as wrong as they are. They are guilty by association. That's the way it is in Ferguson right now, by the way. But he says, the uh, blessed man is set free from this corrupt world, set free from its counsels and viewpoints, set free from going to stand up with them in their evil ways. And then he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. Oh, to be committed to that. If a person follows the philosophy of the age, if they take their stand with those who are doing wrong, they will find themselves then holding in extreme contempt the holy things of God. They will sit with the scornful. But the one who comes to Christ is set in a different direction. He's turned around. He's born again. He has new ideas and new ways. The things that once he hated, now he loves. And the things that once he was involved in, now he turns away from. Because he is a changed person. He has a changed heart. As the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have become new. He is a new person. But secondly, verse 2 tells us that his delight is in the law of the Lord. So while the blessed person is free from the corruption of the world by the grace of God and the new birth by the Spirit of God, he is faithful to the counsels of the Word of God. They guide his steps. He delights in it. Now this word uh, delight is a, a delightful term. And it means to be completely focused upon. To be wrapped up in it. Uh, like... Uh, uh, well, a young man that's in love with a girl, you know, he uh, sits on one side of the room and he cocks an eye at her. She's sitting on the other side of the room and she's cocking an eye at him. And they just sit there looking cockeyed at each other. They, <laughs> they're wrapped up in each other. They delight in each other. They think about each other. And the person who's blessed of God, set free from sin, delights in the Word of God. He can't get away from it. He's, he's in it day by day. He meditates upon it. It tells us here, day by day. Uh, he doth meditate day and night. He can't get away from it. He loves it. Some people can never get to the Word of God. It's something that's boring. It's disinteresting. They don't like it because it doesn't suit their philosophy. It doesn't uh, acknowledge their way of life as right and proper. And so they don't like it. They don't want it. They get angry when they hear it. But the person who has the blessing of God being set free from sin is one who delights in the counsels of the Lord. He can't get away from it. He can't get enough of it. He's there reading it. He's following it. It is the lamp and light to his feet to guide him to steps and paths of righteousness for the name's sake of his heavenly Father. But thirdly, it says there is a result. When you're free from the corruption of the world and you're faithful to the counsels of the word, then you become fruitful in the conduct of his will and work. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now one of the things that vegetation needs more than anything else is water. And you'll notice where, uh, if you're in a, a kind of a barren land, wherever a river goes, there's a tree line on both sides. You see the tree line, you see the river, because it, the trees need that water. And they grow there by the river because of that water that they need. And if it's a fruit tree, it needs to have water in order to produce its fruit. Otherwise, it will be barren. It will die, wither and die. And uh, the one that's with the Lord has the living water of life. 
And it, uh, that tree or that person with the living water of life has a fruit. Now what is fruit? It's the result of one's life. And the fruit of the righteous we have described for us in passages of scripture like this one. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Even he who wins souls is wise. And so as we serve God, the fruit or the results of our labor is other people will come to know him, would come to trust in him, will be saved by his merciful grace. So it is that we desire for the living water of God not only to cleanse our soul and to quench our spiritual thirst, but to flow through our lives and to reach out to other people. They had the different religious festivals of the Jews, seven specific religious festivals that are described in the Old Testament for them to observe so that they could show their faith in anticipation of the fulfillment of the promises of God concerning salvation and concerning His blessing and concerning His strength for life. And so the last of those comes in our October, and uh, there's three of them there together. And, uh, you know, there's three in uh, the time of our March, April, and then there's one in the middle of the summer, and then there's three at the end. The, the, the first one, you know, is the Passover, Pascha, and uh, that showed how that the Lamb of God would one day come and His blood would be shed and the angel of wrath would pass over us. And so they called it the Passover, the Pascha. And then with that was the unleavened bread as uh, it would indicate that being set free from sin would be uh, a, a person whose life would be cleansed and we would not have the leaven of sin influencing our lives. And then there was the uh, first fruits that uh, recognize the resurrection and with Christ's resurrection it would be that others would come forth and give evidence of it and it would also give us the reason for hope that he also would do as he promised and give us a new life when the trumpet sounds and the archangel shouts we call that the rapture of the church and we're called up to be in his presence and so that to symbolize that and then it was uh, 40 uh, well 50 days save one 49, so they called it 49, or Shavuot. We call it Pentecost from the Greek, or the 50th day. And that's when the Spirit of God would come to inaugurate His permanent indwelling of believers that they might be able to serve the Lord. That's why the Lord said when He ascended into heaven after being back 40 days, showing Himself alive again, and giving that evidence so that the believers could have a firm and positive faith, not a blind and irrational leap in the dark, but a leap in the light, and to rest upon the Lord. He said, Now tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And He said, as we would read in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and uh, after that you have that power, or when, it's a Greek word that means at the same time, when you receive that power, then you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so he said we would receive a power to serve. Now, on the last three feasts, we have the feast of the shofarim, or the trumpets. And that is uh, calling us to recognize that uh, we need to wake up and look up for the Lord is coming back with His own. And He's going to establish a righteousness on earth uh, before then. He uh, allows Satan one last effort to do something and he puts him down and cast him in a lake of fire and there's a final judgment and there's the final wedding in heaven, marriage, supper of the Lamb with the church and with the people of God. And then he describes heaven in the most glowing of terms. Walls of jasper, streets of gold, and gates that are open wide. Oh, what a, oh, what a wonderful place. But anyway, here you have that feast of the trumpet sounding, the trumpet shofarim. And then you have a day that we call uh, Yom Kippur, uh, the day of covering. We translate it as the day of atonement. And that just shows that the blood of the Lamb that is shed and as it is sacrificed gives a satisfaction to offended justice. And the high priest is able on that day once a year to go inside the Holy of Holies. 
and there take the blood from the uh, the blood that came from the lamb upon whom the Lord's lot fell, and sprinkled it the seven times upon the mercy seat, showing a covering, a satisfaction of the law's demands. For underneath that seat were the Ten Commandments. That of course showed how far short we came from measuring up to the glory of God. And so access in the Holy of Holies is described by that day of atonement. And then, and then there's the day called tabernacles or Sukkot because it shows us that we who live in a temporal world, in a temporal life, and in a tent as it were, who would take up stakes and go to the Lord and be with Him and enter that place where there are mansions He's prepared above for those who know Him, an eternal home in heaven. Well, here on that last day of the feast that they had, John chapter 8 describes it. John 7 and 8 describes that. John chapter 7 is what I'm referring to. And then in the, in the latter verses of John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, it was a time of a holy celebration of that Feast of Tabernacles, of doing away with the temporal tent on earth and entering into the eternal presence of God in heaven with a firm and eternal home up there. And... Uh, it had three processions of priests. The first procession after 701 B.C. and they had the Pool of Siloam under the advice of that, uh, Isaiah the prophet and the king Hezekiah. Uh, the, the, the priest would go down, the high priest would go down to the Pool of Siloam with a golden vessel taken out of the temple. Uh, another group of priests would prepare the altar for a sacrifice. And uh, a, a, a third group of priests would put the sacrifice on top of the altar and then they would sing a triune hallelujah chorus as the first processional with the high priest at its head came back up the hill from the pool of Siloam to the Mount of Moriah to the place of the temple. And then, and then, there would be a holy hush and the priest would step up and pour out the water upon the sacrifice indicating that because of our great high priest being sacrificed, because of his blood making atonement, and because that blood would cover the demands of justice, uh, that this would open up the door of heaven and we'd have an eternal home. And uh, it would show in the pouring out uh, the cleansing of God's Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Now, it must have been at that time that what we read in John 7, 38 and 39 took place. Jesus stood up, perhaps on a stone pediment there, and yelled out, If any man thirst, they're getting ready to pour out this water. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink, even as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And it explains them further. You see it? This spake he of the Holy Spirit who would be poured out upon us and given to us. To know him in the blessing of forgiveness and redemption is to change our lives and cause us to delight in the word of God which will guide our paths into righteousness for His name's sake. It will be a light in the darkness of this wicked and moral miasma and we'll shine as a light to others. And then we'll be that tree planted by the rivers of living water and therefore we'll be able to bring forth fruit. We'll be able to lead others to Christ. There's an interesting verse in 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 15, where it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Give Him first place. Set Him apart as in charge. Take ego off the throne and put Christ on the throne. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And then it says, And be ready always to give an answer an apologetic defense of the faith. To give an answer to every man and woman, boy and girl, that shall ask of you a reason for the hope they see lying within. 
as our lives are blessed by the Lord. And we walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but delight in the word of God and follow its precepts and principles and let it establish what's right in our own mind and ways and lives. Then others will see in us something they'd like to have for them. And they will ask a reason for that hope that lies within. And you can tell them the good news. Jesus saves. Jesus delivered you. And He can deliver them as well. Now if one continues on in unbelief, the ungodly are not to have this blessing. The ungodly will not have this delight. The ungodly will not have this fruit. But they're like chaff, blown away. They will not stand in judgment. They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. And the Lord knows even those who make a facade of righteousness, but inside there's no root, there's no system of faith, there's no reality. The Lord knows that because He sees our hearts and our hearts need to be changed. And the ungodly shall perish. In which category will you belong? By faith in Christ, the blessed person that God takes home to heaven. Or in rebellion and unbelief. Who will be judged and sent into the everlasting lake of fire called hell. It's your choice. Shall we stand together as we offer an invitation for people to come and receive the Lord. Or people to come and renew their dedication to the Lord or people to come and seek the grace of God in whatever way that's uh, needed as God touches hearts. The pastors are going to come. They're going to turn around and look towards you so that you can see them up here waiting, waiting to receive you, waiting to pray for you, pray with you, and waiting to help counsel to you in the Word of God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the musicians that are preparing now to have a song that gives testimony of how you love us and how you can save us, how you desire to do that. Thank you for these pastors who will stand to greet people. Thank you for those who will come. Thank you for those who need to come and now understand that they can come. Because you said, come to me all ye, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let them know that's true. And let them know they need to make a decision. For we know not about tomorrow. It may not come. We only know about now. And we need to seek the Lord while it may be found. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
who strengthens me. All sin had left a crimson stain, yes, but Jesus washes it by his snow. Jesus paid it all. Choir hums just one more verse. Shall we bow our heads? And as we do, there is a special need in your heart, in your life, for prayer. We're not pointing anybody out. We're not embarrassing about it. We're not come back and yank you to come down the aisle, even though sometimes we'd like to do just that. We're not going to do that. But you'd, you'd like that prayer. Well, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but there's something that you need special prayer about. It may be that you've served God well, but at the present, maybe you're not. You need victory in your life. It may be you've often thought about salvation, but you've never came to a point of surrendering your soul unconditionally to Christ to be saved. So, if there's a need of any kind like that, while I look at Others, if you will, close your eyes and bow your head because we're not trying to embarrass anybody. Would you raise your hand right now? We'll let the pastors know. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity to look into your word, to proclaim the truth of salvation in Christ, and to declare that there is a day of judgment coming and we need to be ready. So as we sing one last verse, dear Father, if you are dealing with someone who ought to come, we pray that they will come and meet a pastor here in front. And we thank you in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. and I turn the service to Brother Pastor here. What blessed people we are indeed, amen? amen? Blessed, blessed are people like us who have the opportunity to come together around God's Word, around God's purpose. Yes. Blessed when we come together in the name of the Lord. You know His promise is that when we gather in His name, He's in the midst of us. Amen. His promise is that when He is lifted up, He will draw us to Himself and we'll experience that this week. Amen? Let me invite you as we as we continue on in this crusade. Now tomorrow evening we have this great time of fellowship. Now as a Baptist, I tell you, fellowship is code for we eat together. Amen. <laughs> I don't know about I don't know if you saw it happen, but I had the privilege of being one of the armed guards that carried the ice cream in a little while ago. <laughs> And, and I want you to know that somebody is going to be staying here all night to guard it, just in case. Isn't that right, Butch? <laughs> just saying. So tomorrow afternoon, the, the ice cream fellowship starts at what time? Four o'clock. And so that fellowship time that we get to have, an old mentor of mine used to say, there's two things that cement our hearts together, and that's when we work together and when we eat together. I would add a third thing, and that's when we worship together. Amen. And we get to do all of those things together this week. And tomorrow is a great example of that. So tomorrow afternoon at 4, just right on up until it's time to, to worship the Lord together. It's going to be a great time. So tomorrow will be a great time for you. If there's somebody that you've been thinking, I wish this friend of mine, I wish this family member of mine, I wish this person that I love, who doesn't know to love my Jesus yet, I wish they'd come with me. Yeah, yeah. You know what's missing? It's your invitation. You know, most studies will show this, that, that people have said, if somebody would invite me, I'd go to church with them. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't believe what you believe, frequently they'd go to church with, just because they like you, just because they're your friend. Mm -hmm. And maybe they would come and maybe the Spirit of God would come upon them 
Yes. Not just through the compelling words of, a, of an experienced preacher, not just through the wonderful music of a practiced choir, but through the power of the Holy Spirit yes. to touch someone's heart. And maybe that's the person you've been praying for for so long. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is your opportunity. Tomorrow night, and then again on Sunday, yes. as we wrap this time together, for the third time that we've gathered in the changing hearts. Oh, it's been sweet, hasn't it? Amen. So, Father, we just want to confess together how blessed we are to be called the sons and daughters of God. Lord, we want to confess together how blessed we are, even those of us who mourn. Lord, we know. We know what it is to be blessed. Even those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, even we know what it is to be blessed. Even those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, even so, Lord, we know You've shown us by Your Spirit that we are blessed by Your presence. Father, I invite you in Jesus' name, Father, to sweep the fellowship in this bride of Christ that is your church in this place. Lord, churches from all over this area, all over this region, who recognize our deep connection to the head that is Jesus Christ. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would awaken us to hunger and thirst for you. Lord, to press in toward one another, to draw near in the body of Christ, connecting deeply with you, connecting deeply with each other and hearts breaking for a needy world, so desperate to find the hope that only you can give. Oh, Lord Jesus, we praise you that somehow by your mercy, we have found our hope in you. Lord, let us be the ones to lead the people that we love so dearly to meet the one who's loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow.